Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Can you hear me well? Okay, and you can see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Hannah, for the uh, beautiful introduction and land acknowledgement. Um, and today I am going to, um, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Monica Rana. I'm the postdoctoral research fellow and interim managing director here at Cerevic. Um, and today the presentation will focus on the research that we have been doing in the past few years among South Asian sexual minority youth. Um, so one second, okay, yeah. And so today our agenda is, to, I, I would like to introduce the center that we are working here in at Sarawak, and then we will go about the different projects that we have been doing among South Asian youth. Um, and so these are the three different studies that we have been doing, and I will be sharing the results with you all today. And then also what are the ongoing research that we have, we are currently in progress with South Asian, that involves South Asian. Um, LGBTQ youth, and in the end, we'll have a session on Q&A. So Cerevic, the Stigma and Resilience Among Vulnerable Youth Center, we here aim to understand the stigma and discrimination on health disparity of marginalized youth, including LGBTQ2S plus uh, youth. Um, so we try to understand the factors that contribute to stigma and violence. We also our vision is to improve health outcomes and health equity for marginalized youth across Canada and internationally. Um, and our main, one of the research that we are doing right now is we document health and disparities among LGBTQ2S plus youth in diverse ethno-cultural group, including South Asia that I will be discussing today. And our goal is to create culturally relevant interventions for families and school. Um, so the first um, study um, or project that I will be discussing is, is South Asian Young Men Qualitative uh, Study. Um, to give a bit background about this study is that um, we, uh, we conduct Brit British Columbia Adolescent Health Survey um, every five years where we collect data among youth in different schools. And while doing that, that analysis of that data, we found that not many, in fact, less than 20 South Asian men, boys, identify themselves from the LGBTQ group. So we didn't have much data to kind of understand about what um, the health disparities that South Asian um, boys face, or we couldn't do the analysis. So we went to our South Asian advisory um, members and discussed that with them. And so this study was suggested by them. And so uh, we basically did is, we explored the um, experiences of South Asian men about being gay and bisexual, particularly at home and in school. And also we tried to understand the parental behaviors uh, that are considered um, supportive by gay and bisexual young men. Um, and to do that, the methodology was we, um, so the, we had South Asian gay or bisexual young men aged 19 to 25 years of age. And basically our recruitment, how did we recruit, recruit these youth were particularly in collaborations with our community partners in Vancouver, um, to name a few were. Uh, um, uh, and so the study staff initiated contact. We did not contact the with potential participants. Our ad was uh, on these, um, community partners and that's how we enrolled the youth in our study and um, the data was collected using semi-structured interviews that lasted between 45 minutes to one hour and so we had an interview guide which in addition to various demographic questions also included questions such as like what it is like being South Asian, um, gay or bisexual. And so if you came out in school, what was the experience like? Um, did you feel any different from other kids of your age uh, when you were in school? Um, and so what are their experiences when they came out um, to their parents? If they have come out, what were the experiences if they have not? What are the barriers that prevented for them to come out? Um, and in the end, we also talked about how it is to be a gay and bisexual men in South Asian communities and what are the various recommendations that they would like to give to like for parents, for schools, for the communities. Um, 
to improve basically health outcomes and to improve coming out experiences of South Asian young men. And, uh, and so in the study, we um, conducted 15 interviews between February and September. And um, interviews were either face-to-face -face by telephone or Zoom. We initially started interviewing face-to-face, -face, but then COVID happened and then our study moved on to Zoom and telephone, through telephone. Um, so, um, so the characteristics of the 15 South Asian um, gay and bisexual men who were interviewed are provided in this slide. Um, and so face-to-face -face were conducted um, among two participants and the remaining were conducted over phone or Zoom. Um, and this, this, as I said, it was during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the age of the participants ranged from 19 to 25 years. And so about half of the participants immigrated to Canada less than five years ago, and other half had been living in Canada for more than five years. And so most of the participants, around 11, were we interviewed, identified as gay. And also the majority of the participants who we interviewed had come out to their parents. And so, and those who did not come out, we tried to explore what are the barriers that prevented them from coming out. Um, um, so if, before I discuss the findings, I would also like to kind of share what's the whole data analysis looked like. We, transcribed all the interviews and we systematically analyzed using interpretive descriptions. It's basically we identify section of the interviews that describe the coming out experiences of participants with their parents, parents um, the coming out experiences in school, the circumstances that prevented them to hide, their, hide that in school or not come out to their parents. And so we examine these descriptions for patterns and relationships. And that's how we did the whole analysis. And so the first main finding that um, we, um, the main, first main finding as coming out experiences of these youth were that the first experiences was very challenging. And so like one of the 25 year old gay said that the absence of entire conversation about alternative sexualities led me thinking for longest time that something was wrong with me. And another 20 year old shared that I had attraction to men, but I kept inside because the environment was extremely unsupportive. And so many of the youth talked more about because there were no conversations in their family or in their community about um, belonging to LGBTQ and that whole led to this first experience of coming out to be very challenging. Uh, and when they discussed about school experiences that were also very difficult for the participants and like a 19 year old share that it was a terrifying experience in school. And another 20 year old share that I just identified heterosexual and because that was the safest thing to do. Um, and another one shared was I was very shy and more feminine, which is why I was subjected to a lot of bullying in school. So the experiences range from them hiding their identity to if, if they expressed um, experiences of bullying in school. Um, the next section of the um, interview was how were their parental reactions to coming out. And so um, the participant who had disclosed their sexual, sexual orientation to their parents reported a range of reactions from them, most of them which were negative. And so the result of the study, the whole conversation that 15 youth had when they shared, um, when they came out to their parents suggested that they, because of the traditional homophobic um, attitudes among South Asian cultures. Also, there is really high expectation of South, uh, South Asian children to maintain family honor. South Asian gay and bisexual youth find it very challenging um, to navigate, come out to their parents. And so, and also this is the same reason because of this whole South Asian culture that parents also find it very difficult to accept their child's sexual orientation. And so the whole conversation around coming out 
um, the youth were discussing how their reaction to their orientation was basically also largely influences, influenced by their extended family, their community members, and their parents talking about how their uncles or aunties will feel about it. And so, and, and so since many people in South Asian community are not accept, accepting of sex, same-sex relationships, youth were hesitant to come out to their parents and feared the worst, including some of the youth talked about, even if they came out, they were discussing about when they were not out to their parents and what were going on that time. And they said they feared the worst. They feared that they will be disowned by their family members. And so South Asian culture is, so the whole coming out experiences of South Asian youth is largely played by how, what, how South Asian culture is. And that determines their parents' attitude to coming out to their sexuality. And so the range of reactions for parents range from anger, disappointment, denial, and to ignoring the disclosure. And so like one of the youths shared and literally for two and a half hour, it was yelling, pleading, guilt tripping on why I can't be gay, why I shouldn't be gay, how people out there are converting people, making people gay is one of the few experiences that South Asian youth shared in the interview. Um, a few um, participants also shared um, the reaction from their parents, which were supportive. And some of them looked like this. They still treat me the same. They have been supporting cooking my favorite food. And so these are some of the things that youth feel if the parents do, they consider it supportive. Um, like just doing the same things we used to do um, and continuing the same routine, the same kind of relationship. Um, another youth shared, my parents only had a lot of questions and queries, which was appreciated by youth. So they want their parents to ask them questions, ask their doubts. Um, so they were never angry about it. They never expected me to like, you know, change something about um, uh, myself and it was positive like that and there was another one which was um, shared by one of the youth I, and they said like I slip it to my mother in grade 11 that I was gay her reaction was oh I have no idea about it so you are going to walk me through it and so that was something the, um, the youth said I that was an amazing reaction because I wasn't kicked out of the house. I wasn't getting screamed. And so they feared the worst. And so they just want their parents, even if they are not supportive at first, but trying to understand, trying to ask questions was kind of supportive at this point when they come out. Um, also, we also talked about the whole South Asian community and how they felt being gay and bisexual in South Asian community. And so mostly, um, like this is the first one, participants identified that there are resources for gay and bisexual youth, but mostly only for white gay and bisexual folks. So if there's anything like through media, it's very white. If there's anything, it's not pertinent because it's not South Asian. And so many participants described a lack of South Asian specific resources for LGBTQ people and felt that most of the LGBTQ resources were targeted to white folks. The whole, and they explained that the whole gay community and culture is dominant by white people. You are just an outlier in an outlier situation. And it has been really hard to navigate. That was something shared by a 21 year old. Um, and so, from this, the whole conversation, they suggested that the resources available to support sexual minority youth should be culturally adapted for the South Asian community because the coming out experiences of South Asian youth are very different. They explained that culturally relevant information must be included in these resources. For example, one of the youth shared that I can read pamphlets about coming out to your parents, but I know that they're not true because my experience as a South Asian man of being like, okay, that's not how that works. I know the kids, ha they had to exile their parents completely out of their life. And that's a reality and it's a scary reality. And so I think resources should be, sh should focus on it and how to deal with that is very important. And so, and so they also kind of focused on how there is lack of these resources in South Asian community as a whole, like a 19 year old said, the, 
as I asked them the question, like, are there any resources? It's like, God, oh my God, no. And so this just showed like how much there's lack of these resources in the South Asian um, spaces. Um, coming to uh, talking about um, recommendations. And so we went on asking participants uh, about what would they recommend when they came out in their school, their experiences, how would they like to change it? What what would support them in their school? And so the participants suggested that school need to work on increasing visibility of sexual and gender minorities and including specific resources. Um, and I think one of the main suggestions, which many of them did is that the resources should not be just for the students, but for their parents as well. And so additional resources should be offered in different languages, especially for the immigrant parents when they come here. Uh, coming to recommendations for parents, and I think this was very important when they said that participants, for most part, expected that their parents would not accept their sexuality when they had disclosed their orientation to them. And many participants were even sympathetic of their parents' positions if they had rejected them and recognized that their understanding of sexuality were just a byproduct of being raised in conservative culture where queer identity has been and continues to be rejected. And so for instance, one participant said, to be honest, they have been brought up, so they, their parents have been brought up in a way, they have been conditioned in a way to learn and believe that homosexuality is wrong. And similarly, another participant reasoned that because of their parents were raised in such an environment, they, that did not allow them to engage in conversation of sexual orientations other than heterosexuality. And so they did not have the foundation to understand the concept of these sexualities. So even though several participants were understanding of their parents' view, so many participants believe that South Asian parents could take several steps to support their sexual minority youth. For example, most participants wanted their parents to be open to learning, open to learn, be more communicative, ask questions. And so, and it was also important and for the parents to understand that being queer was not a choice. And so, for instance, one participant said that they wanted their parents to know it's not my choice. Being gay, it just comes. It's natural to me. I can't be forced in a romantic relationship with a female. And that's something parents should understand. And that's something should be focused in the resources that we give to South Asian parents. Another participant, again, focused on it that I feel like parents, I think they should really understand that it's not choice, it's something you're born with and it doesn't change who your kid is. Your child is still the same child that was born. And so um, similarly, another participant said that parents need to stop relying on preconceived notions and then on these relying on traditions and this idea that you know what a girl should act like, what a boy should act like, and those strict gender roles, and that comes back from the tradition. And so th this shared experience of being rejected by their parents because these of these cultural beliefs. And I think that's what our focus should be when we are designing interventions or support for some parents. And so they urge South Asian parents of sexual minority to keep an open mind when they're discussing their child sexuality. Many participants describe, you know, and so this whole cultural thing leads to that they're in that how much it is tied to South Asian community. And so there where the South Asian community suggestions came in, and I think this is all very interconnected. And so they said that most participants describe religious and cultural institutions. These are the pillar of South Asian community. And so wanted their involvement. That's the suggestion that these instrument, this institution are such instrumental to enforcing South Asian norms and values. And so when the South Asian parents often sought guidance from these religious figures and community members, and so involving them from South Asian community, involving um, these institutions to give knowledge to their parents is the suggestion that they gave. And 
and they said that many participants were several persons explained that religious and cultural in, uh, institutions and these influential people from South Asian community should be involved in creating visibility for LGBTQ people. And so by creating spaces for them and sharing positive knowledge about the group could be really helpful, could be really a step forward in improving their coming out experiences. And so these are the findings and these are the experiences the South Asian young gay um, and bisexual men shared in this study. Um, next, I will move on to the um, our next study, which is similar. It's just, it's about sexual minority youth experiences and perspectives of parental support in Canada. It's a larger study um, and uh, the objectives of this project are um, to explore the experiences of youth about being a sexual minority in their family, to document the cultural diversity of parental responses. So we are we are creating all the responses that uh, and kind of a, um, document all these um, um, kind of responses that a youth consider are supportive and youth consider are not supportive and what would they suggest. So creating kind of a, a document about that. And so to understand the parental behavior that are considered accepting and supportive by sexual minority youth in Canada, and to understand the parental behaviors that are considered rejected, rejecting bisexual minority youth. And uh, so this is a larger study where we have online focus groups. So these are these, we, con we conducted these 12 focus group among youth across Canada, and we had different categories, general Canadian, East Asian, South Asian, and rural C Canadian. And so this is basically to create those cultural diversity and responses as well, and the experiences. And so as these are asynchronous online focus group, this was con uh, the, these were conducted using an online bulletin board, which is called PHPB, where people can come, uh, the youth and participants can come anytime. We posted questions like twice in a day, in the morning and the afternoon. And so youth from different time zones can come to see those questions, answer them. If they want to reply to anybody else's response, they could at their own convenience. And um, each focus group took place over three days and participants agreed to visit two to three times per day over the three days. And so we could see participants answering each other's responses as well. Um, and if there are any response that we wanted to kind of follow up on, the moderators were always looking at that online board. And so this was a way to conduct these bigger focus group across Canada. And so one of the group was South Asian and we are still in the process of analyzing them. And so I will um, uh, share some preliminary findings. Um, so we conducted two online focus group with South Asian youth. One was with South Asian girls were around 14 we conducted with. And another group was South Asian, any gender was there in which there were three males, female seven and non-binary five. Um, so the preliminary findings were the participants who came out to their parents shared similar reactions that were either showing a negative or ignoring. I mean, ignoring the youths coming out was also shared by so many youth that when they come out, their parents started behaving as if it never happened. And um, and then when we discussed about what are the barriers that the uh, South Asian youth mentioned were they wanted to be first sure about their sexuality before coming out. And they also had a fear about uh, if they're coming out would kind of change their relationship with their parents. And, um, and again, these focus groups also stressed on how South Asian community is not uh, accepting of sexual minority people, hence, hence their parents will not accept their sexuality and that assumption also prevented them to coming out to their parents. Um, and so we asked about what does a positive or a neutral response look like? And these were the responses from South Asian youth, like cool, nice, talking about how their date went with their partner. And I think majority of them just said like, a word of support from their parents that we support you no matter what, and we will continue to have same relationship was considered positive 
by youth. And we some of the examples of non-supportive parental responses, including making fun of their sexual orientation, arguing, yelling, shaming, especially um, saying it's a sin or kind of expecting them to change, like after everything we have done for you, how could you do this? So shaming them and saying it's a sin um, it was considered um, um, non-supportive. And so these are a quite a very brief preliminary findings, but we are in the process of analyzing all these um, uh, focus groups nationally conducted across Canada. Um, the next study that is uh, that we are con uh, we conducted is using this uh, British Columbia Adolescent Health Survey, and uh, the, the study is risk and protective factors for suicidality among South Asian sexual uh, minority girls and. Um, research suggests that individuals who have intersecting identities, like being a sexual minority and South Asian or from any ethnic minority, um, experience heightened psych psychological distress, poor mental health because of their minority position. However, despite a number of studies about the increased risk of suicide among sexual minority youth, little is known about in Canada about suicidality and sexual orientation among South Asian adolescents. Um, one of the recent study that was done in 2020 points out that there is lack of empirical research pertaining to South Asian sexual minority women and none that examine their experiences of racism in Western nation. Um, and so such oversight can also endorse a false narrative that discrimination among South Asian sexual, South Asian youth is insignificant and um, sexual minority South Asian teens, which is the uh, study population, may find it challenging working through their um, multiple minority identities. In addition, they may be rejected and isolated, which, which uh, the previous studies have documented from South Asian LGBTQ communities. Um, and so the study was basically to um, to see those um, risk and protective what protects them from this is the suicidality outcomes. Um, and so with this rationale, we did the objectives was to understand the risk of suicide, uh, suicidal ideation and suicidal attempt among sexual minority South Asian girls compared to their heterosexual peers. Um, we also sought to determine the risk and protective factors associated with this um, suicidal ideation and attempt among sexual minority and heterosexual South Asian girls in British Columbia. Um, Talking about the BC, I just wanted to give a more brief overview of what a BC Adolescent Health Survey is. Um, this is a school-based representative data. Um, and for this study, we use the 2018 BCHS, and it is a pro province-wide survey of youth health risk behaviors and protective factors for health, de health development conducted by McCready Center Society. The survey uses a cluster sampling design to to obtain a representative sample of students from grade seven through grade 12. And, and for 2018 BCHS, it was conducted across 840 schools across 58 school districts. And there were a total of 38,000, um, around 38,000 uh, students. Um, and so the study particularly I, uh, utilized responses from this 2018 BCHS from participants who identified as South Asian girls and reported their sexual orientation. Um, and so the survey gives an evidence base of youth health trends, emerging issue, risk and protective factors um, in the BCHS and total South Asian girls, which we uh, analyzed in the study were 2020 and heterosexual were one. 1,871 and mostly heterosexual and LGB were 149. Um, coming to what the measures we used in this study was outcomes were suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts were the main outcomes. Uh, we assessed suicidal ideation and attempt through question that asked youth whether they had considered killing themselves in the past 12 months, which was suicidal ideation, and whether they had tried to kill themselves in the past 12 months, which was suicidal attempt. 
Um, for the risk factor, we created an enacted stigma index through a score of um, uh, stigma experiences. Some of these questions were, in the past 12 months, have you been discriminated against or treated unfairly because of your race, ethnicity, or skin colors? Similarly, discriminated based on your sexual orientation, on your gender sex, uh, because of a disability, because of your physical experiences, have you been physically abused or sexually abused? Have you been victim of any type of school-based bullying? In the past, when did somebody bully you or pick you through internet? How many times have you had unwanted sexual comments or gestures directed, you, directed at you? And so all these questions, uh, we made a score and that ranged from zero to 10. Um, that was the risk factor uh, that we uh, the risk factor measure for the protective factor measures we had school connectedness which is a five item scale that has just demonstrated reasonable reliability and validity in BC student population and school connectedness measured the extent to which students perceive being cared about and treated fairly by teachers getting along with their teachers being part of their school and being happy at school. Um, another protective factor was family connectedness, which is a seven item scale, and this measures how youth felt close and connected to their mother, their father, and their family. We had caring neighborhood adults, which was assessed for, by how true is the statement for you in my neighborhood community, not from my school or family, there is an adult who really cares about me, and responses varied from pretty very much to not at all a little. And we also had close friends. It was to assess involvement with peers. We used an item from the survey that asked, how many close friends do you have in your school or neighborhood? And the response varied from zero to two. Um, so what we did for analysis is we compared the prevalence of suicidal ideation and attempt between the LGB and the mostly heterosexual students and the heterosexual using chi-square test. We uh, you did logistic regression to test the association between these risk and protective factors and the suicidal outcomes. And uh, since all the models were um, adjusted for age because there are significant association between age and suicidal ideation. So we adjusted all the models for age. Uh, coming to the results, um, the prevalence of suicidal ideation and suicidal attempt were much larger among sexual minority girls than among heterosexual girls. About 15% of South Asian heterosexual girls um, uh, reported having had suicidal ideation and four persons ever attempting suicidal attempt, whereas more than half of sexual minority girls reported having had suicidal ideation and nearly 14 persons reported having attempted suicide and these were significant, significant findings. Uh, coming to the models for the risk and protective factors, um, enacted stigma was a significant um, predictor for both heterosexual and mostly heterosexual and LGB combined. Um, so the odds ratio of 1.43 uh, means is for every additional different experience of stigma, the odds of having suicidal ideation increased by 1.4 among South Asian girls and similarly around 1.4 um, among mostly heterosexual and LGB girls. Um, coming to what, what, is, what are the protective factors, school and family Connectedness were important, uh, important factors in reducing suicidal ideation, particularly for heterosexual girls. Uh, so both these scales were standardized for scores from zero to one with high scores showing a larger reduction of suicidal ideation. Uh, similarly, family connectedness had a significant impact um, effect on in reducing suicidal ideation. Um, and um, there was no significant uh, associations between school connectedness and family connectedness for LGB and mostly heterosexual girls. Um, coming to the results for suicidal attempts, these were similar to suicidal ideation. So uh, enacted stigma was significantly significant for heterosexual girls. So every source of enacted stigma, the odds ratio for suicidal attempt increased 1.5 times for heterosexual girls. Um, the presence of a caring adult in neighborhood was related to a significant reduction in odds of suicidal attempt for all South Asian girls. 
Uh, in the end, I would like to talk about what are the different ongoing research that is, uh, we are doing right currently that involves South Asian youth. Um, one of the projects that is currently ongoing and we are recruiting participants are stressors experienced by parents of sexual and gender minority youth in collectivist communities. So, um, so although research has provided some direction about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirit, and other youth need from their parents to thrive, which is like warmth, care, closenessness, we have limited knowledge of what are the stresses and barriers that parents face. And so we are recruiting parents so that in supporting their youth. So we try to understand what are these barriers um, that they face in supporting their youth. And, and what are the parent strategies for managing these stressors and barriers? And, and our research is focusing on identifying these culturally specific knowledge to create these family and youth interventions. And that is our goal, to create these intervention to improve health and reduce health disparities among sexual minority youth. And so these interventions will seek to effectively reach youth and their parents in rural and in urban areas and among diverse cultural groups in order to improve support, health knowledge, and motivation for healthy copings. Um, so in this study, we are enrolling parents of sexual and gender minority youth, and we are either they, they can be enrolled if they're, it's their choice for being an online focus group, which is an asynchronous, similar to what we did for youth, or one-on-one -on -one interviews over Zoom, and uh, there will be separate focus group and interviews for South Asian parents. Um, and as I mentioned, to identify these culturally specific knowledge, um, the study also will try to, um, using these findings, we want to also try to create online and text-based interventions to reach parents um, so that the access for parents in rural areas using these online interventions. Um, we are... Currently, we are also doing the quantitative analysis for BC Atlas using BC Atlas and Health Survey. And we are trying to analyze the trends over time as BC Atlas and Health Survey is conducted every five years. So we will be using from 2008 to 2018 and to understand how the trends have been with respect to bullying, discrimination, and suicidal ideation for the past decade. And so this will help us to understand that there have been any improvement in health inequalities between straight and sexual minority South Asian youth over the past decade. Um, thank you. Um, and if there are any Q and A's, I'll stop sharing. Perfect. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, a you know virtual round of applause for you. Um, I learned so much in the past 30 minutes that I did not know. Um, and I work here, so um, uh, I don't know what that says about me. Maybe I shouldn't admit that, but um, <laughs> we do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, sorry, as we, uh, as Zoom transition screens, I of course lost the chat, but um, first uh, we are going to start off with um, Shivinder asked in the chat, um, thanks for the presentation and doing this important work. Um, you mentioned earlier that in part of the conceptualization of this study, you reached out to a South Asian advisory committee. I'm curious what this lo looked like and how you went about this process. Um, Elizabeth, I would like you to kind of talk about the South Asian sure. advisory. <laughs> yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Sawick. I'm um, the executive director of, of Saravik and um, the, uh, um, the advisory work actually started before Monica joined us. Um, and uh, well, um, Renita Nath, who's our managing director, um, was here, um, who's currently on parental leave. So um, how we went about the, the advisory um, committee was actually reaching out to groups like Share Vancouver, which is a, um, um, a South Asian group for South Asian um, gay, lesbian, and bisexual people and support for their families um, to actually identify um, folks to, to um, work with us. We also reached out to the school districts and to um, um, public health nurses and, um, and to um, youth on campus students. And so our advisory included some South Asian graduate students here at UBC, as well as 
um, members from Share Vancouver and um, um, at least one or two um, South Asian public health nurses who work with um, youth and then um, um, a couple uh, of, of students in high school as well. And we brought them together for a, a series of um, um, uh, meetings. And of course, I see Jasleen, yes. Um, um, shout out to Jasleen, who was one of our advisory members um, for that project. Um, fabulous. Um, so, so we um, brought people together to guide the analyses that we were going to do with the BC Adolescent Health Survey, as well as when we had those first analyses, brought everyone back together and said, hey, we have very few gay South Asian boys. Um, here is the data we have about the girls, but like there are no gay South Asian boys in school, at least not that we can do any analyses with. And that's when, in fact, the advisory suggested some reasons why that might be, and then suggested further that we actually um, do a qualitative study with slightly older South Asian young men um, who were gay and bisexual and willing to talk about their experiences, both either coming out or not being out and, and why not. And so um, that, um, that project was just getting going as, as Monica joined us and um, led that particular part of the um, analyses. And so, so the advisory has provided us with some um, sort of key guidance and suggestions about both how to, to engage in some of this work and um, what some of the outcomes mean and what we should do in terms of of with the community. And we also had um, a couple folks who have uh, reached out to potentially as graduate students to potentially be involved with us in, in doing some further research. Great, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, we have another question in the chat from James, um, two actually. Thanks for the great presentation, Monica. I have two questions. For the first study, I believe you said that some of the particip participants had migrated to Canada. Were there any key differences between migrants versus non-migrants in, in terms of their coming out experiences? And then in the second study, um, did the non-binary youth talk about their experiences coming out as non-binary or just their sexual orientations? Um, so for the first question, uh, thank you, James. These are like great questions. Um, and so for the migrant and the non-migrants, many of the youth who had recently immigrated to Canada were not staying with their parents. So their parents were in India or in any South Asian uh, country, and they have moved here to study or work. Um, and so the because of this, there were differences because the youth who were still here were living with their parents and were navigating through those, uh, those um, barriers while coming out, while staying with their parents. Um, and I think the main difference was many of the uh, youth who were here for more than five years, their parents asked them more questions, trying to understand their sexuality. Whereas youth who were recently immigrated just left after coming out to their parents they came to canada so that's how they were experienced that's where how they dealt with their coming out so that was what i found in the interviews that we did um for the second study did the uh yes so for the second study though we we uh, recruited youth who were non-binary but the questions were that uh, were specifically asking about their coming out experiences uh as per their sexual orientation. So they did not talk about their experiences because our questions were specifically directed towards their coming out experiences as a sexual minority youth. Um, I hope that answers your question. Beautiful, um, perfect. Uh, uh, feel free to add more questions in the chat, but I, I had a question actually. I felt like listening to this presentation is such a testament to why folks from the community being researched should be doing the research, right? Um, because there's just so much in it that for me, uh, 
uh, as not part of the community, I'm like, oh, of course, of course, that's what you would do. But I could never think of that, right, or anticipate this. And so I was thinking about what um, unique pathways to safer coming out experiences can you imagine that are culturally appropriate, appropriate, and don't um, sort of have an assimilation mindset, right? You know, with that relies on very white LGBTQ advocacy. Um, you mentioned um, involving these community leaders and things like that, but uh, is there other culturally relevant information or programs that um, that exist or that you can imagine or your participants imagined um, that would not necessarily resemble sort of dominant white um, LGBTQ advocacy? Yeah, I think so many of the uh, coming out experiences do not talk about the uh, whole South Asian cultures and why it is why those cultures have such a homophobic attitude towards it, where their parents are coming out. And I think most of the youth really suggested that that we need these these um, um, resources for their parents should include those South Asian background and just and especially because they they fear they'll be uh, the parents would just disown them. And so talking to their parents from the basic specifics that being gay is biological, they don't have to, they can't change them, their relationship should stay the same. And so I think starting from their, that basic is something which, we, which uh, being in a white community, you might not be doing it. And so I think they really wanted to start from this. Uh, additionally, they thought whatever um, LGBTQ sex, uh, um, communities role models they were looking at in Canada, they didn't have representation from South Asian community at all. And so their parents would think this is a white thing. This is not a South Asian thing. And so I think this stressed so much that we should have role models from the South Asian community that sets an example for their parents that this is not a white thing. This is a normal thing in the South Asian community as well so that they can associate with it. So those specific things. And so a and lot of parents go to these religious communities. They're so many South Asian small communities, um, gatherings that happen. And I think that was the main suggestion that, that we should be using them. Their parents go there to get suggestions. And so if these spaces uh, normalize these things, normalize talking about LGBTQ community, their parents would think that, yes, this is something they can talk to their kid. Their kid is normal. They're not different. And I think so this whole different attitude that South Asian parents have can be focused only if we have South Asian specific resources. And so I've, I've written a paper on recommendations, which will talk about this in detail, uh, which is in review for now. And I think when they'll come out, which will give more details on what exactly we need to do as a South Asian community, as a South Asian parent. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Jasmine has added in our chat, um, I remember you mentioned that though most of the reactions from parents to their children coming out was negative, there were some supportive families. I was wondering if there were any common trends as to why those families were more supportive. And I would maybe add my own personal uh, addition here of how were they more supportive? Um, what did that support look like? Yeah. Yeah, so I can say about the trend, but I feel the two families that were supportive, they were, their parents were already in Canada. So maybe that whole uh, being in Canada and being in India or being in any South Asian country. I'm talking India more because many of the participants were from India. Um, so maybe saying there was difference or maybe that's the common trend, but I would say asking questions, what does it look like? Explain to me what being a sexual minority is. Let's consider supportive, ask questions. The youth is ready to explain you what this is. Of course, we come from a community where we don't talk about it. Our parents don't know about it. And so ask questions and that is supportive. They are ready to walk you through the whole process. And so the parents who ask like, you know, tell me what it is like, the the, the youth really considered um, supportive. Another thing is we have so much, as a South Asian community, we eat, we have dinner together, lunch together. We have these um, large family gatherings together. So we have like this kind of relationship. It's continuing those 
um, similar routines over after, even after your youth has come out is something they would prefer. Just continue being the same, just continue that relationship, continue meeting them, continue inviting them to these gatherings was like was one of the main, um, to, uh, to name a few, was considered supportive. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you. Um, Sophie has added, um, Let's see, uh, such an interesting presentation, thank you. You mentioned how impactful religious and cultural institutions are on beliefs of parents. Do you know of any South Asian institutions or leaders that might be open to educating parents? And then uh, uh, they added, or what might this connection between parents and institutions look like? Um, I would add like a, a community, now Elizabeth mentioned Share Vancouver. So they do these kind of gatherings. They do these kind of picnics for LGBTQ youth where they, you can invite your parents and if they have any questions. So this, this is community gatherings where you can come and ask questions. And so I think the only thing is connection is being South Asian, that common connection if you have. And then if you talk about these things, the parents would kind of, we will that will make it a bit normalized if that's, that's what I mean it, it makes sense and I think that's the connection they want and now so there are I think one of the youth specifically said that there was a South Asian couple gay couple that got married and so what he did is he printed that whole story out and gave it to their parents to say this is South Asian the youth they're getting married look at how everybody's happy this is normal and so he printed it out and gave it to their parents so I think that kind of examples from South Asian community connections through these communities to these gatherings and I think in Canada because a lot of migrants when they come they go to these religious institutes and there are these small gatherings, there are these groups that meet regularly. So I think using these already created spaces for these conversation would be, I think, first starting point. And that was something said by majority of the participants, the main recommendation, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like the infrastructure is already there. We just gotta yeah, put just the car on the road, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, or the train on the tracks, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that, and that is a testament to how like Saravik identifies the strengths, right? It's like, what exists already? Like, we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time that we're trying to um, make things better for folks. Um, I'm out of questions. Um, are there any other questions in the chat? Um, I'll make sure nobody is frantically typing. Um, but it looks like that is what we have for today. I am so thankful for um, everyone who's participated in this whole series, but especially Monica today. Thank you so much for your hard work. Um, and thank you all for coming. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at future events in uh, from Saravik. So um, yeah, and feel free to get in touch via our website. Uh, we're always open for questions after the fact. And this recording will be on YouTube sometime time in July when I come back from vacation. So um, yeah, thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much.